the temple they were about to build, the second temple as it's called, under Zerubbabel, um, was going to last until Herod the Great in the, the years just before Christ. Herod the Great was going to, uh, what he hoped was he was going to build the third temple. So he replaced this rinky-dink chapel with this magnificent a marble edifice, a huge temple with precincts and walls and all kinds of amazing things. It was just glorious. But the people refused to call it the third temple. To this day, the Jews still call Herod's temple the second temple. It just got fixed up a little bit by Herod. And why don't they want to give Herod the great the credit for building the temple of God? Absolutely self-serving. Also, there's a problem with who he is in his heritage. He's an Edomite. He was an Idumean. He's not a Jew. So they're not going to give him credit. And so even to this day, even though archaeology suggests there were really three temples, uh, the Jews and archaeologists and theologians will say, no, no, just two temples. The one built by Solomon on David's plan and the one rebuilt here by Zerubbabel, probably half the size of Solomon's, you know, and probably wood, but maybe some stone around the outside or something like that. And then Herod the Great just kind of prettied it up later on, you know, by making it three times as big or twice as big or whatever, but uh, whatever. I don't know how many of you know this, a couple of you do, um, but the old school of St. Paul's that used to be oh, Kitty Corner where the parking lot is now, built on the, the site of the ruined first church after the, after the tornado. Um, originally, that building was just a four-room, one-story building. And then two more, I mean, a couple more rooms got built on top of it a few years later until... And it got added to that way. It, didn't, it never got torn down once part of it was built. It just got added to. So that by the time of much of this congregation's grandparents, um, it was a bigger building with, with, with hallways and a downstairs and, and a stage and so forth. But it was built in a weird way so that I've asked, but it was never torn down. That's my point. It was just kind of added on to the way Herod added on to the original temple. And such that I've been, I've, I have asked several people who went to that school and a couple who taught in it, if they could draw me a floor plan of the school, they can't. They, they, because the mind tries to work logically and it wasn't a logically constructed building. And so they, they'll, they'll, I, I've had, can you sketch it out? They'll kind of draw and they're like, oh, that can't be right. And they'll draw and they'll throw that away. And I, so I've, I have all these partial drawings where I had a few of them. And then they got confiscated by the guy who drew them. He said, no, no, that's wrong, pastor. You can't have that. So I have nothing. So I've been trying to get this plan of what the school was like. And, but even the men who served as teachers and women can't give me uh, an idea of what the thing looked like on the inside. Um, That's a fascinating problem. I don't know if we'll ever fix that. Oh, let's get to the second message. The glory of the house. On the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through Haggai the prophet. Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel. This is the guy who's in the line of the Savior, remember. And Joshua, the high priest, and to the surviving remnant of the people. Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look now? Doesn't it seem like nothing in your eyes? Uh, this is not a photograph of the actual ruins of the first temple, by the way. It's just a photograph of ruins. It's hard to get decent pictures of ruins in Israel um, today. A lot of them are copyrighted. Uh, 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 one of my colleagues went to Israel and Greece and has given me permission to use all of his pictures of everything. However, because of his fascination for selfies, he's in almost every picture I have. <laughs> of everything in Israel. So, I don't know. I may... I have a habit of when I'm going to take a picture of taking it like this, not like this. I just... uh, I don't know. It's just a difference in personality. It's fine. 
This passage was my ordination sermon text when my uncle preached for my ordination in 1999. But now be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Get to work. So that was the sermon text. Be strong, be strong, be strong, and get to work. Uh, get to work, and I will be with you, declares the Lord of armies. There it is, Laura. I will be with you, declares the Lord of armies. This is the promise I made to you when you left Egypt. My spirit remains in your midst. Do not be afraid. Now the Lord takes them all the way back with just one sentence, all the way back to the Exodus. And what did you bring out of Egypt? Nothing? You know, I mean, I mean, I know that we plundered the Egyptians, perhaps, people might think, but individual Israelites might have just been pushing a wheelbarrow with Aunt Betty in it. You know, you're not really getting out of Egypt with a lot, and, you know, just with your children and, you know, and, and, and your family. But who was with you? God was with you the whole way. And the Lord says, my spirit is still with you. My spirit remains in your midst. Do not be afraid. Listen, this is what the Lord of armies says. Once again, in a little while, I myself will shake the heavens and the earth, the seas and the dry land. I will shake all the nations and the desired of all the nations will come. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of armies. Can I ask you a completely unfair question? Okay, who is the desired of nations? Why do you think it's Jesus? Answer honestly. I think that's a valid, that's a valid answer. Half the Christians in the world have answered Jesus to this question. I, uh, I, I really think it's because there's a hymn um, with come desired of nations. You know, I, I think Hark the Herald, which is by uh, John Wesley's brother, um, the other Wesley. Anyway, uh, because the other Wesley uh, uh, wrote Hark the Herald and wrote a verse with Come Desired of Nations, a lot of Christians today think that Desired of Nations here must be Jesus, and it makes sense. However, most of the Christian church before the Methodist movement began did not think that this referred to Christ, but to the blessings that come along with Christ. And part of the issue we're going to talk about at the end of the class, because I'm going to save the argument here, is because uh, the verb come here, will come, is plural and not singular. They will come. And uh, well, incidentally, if any of you ever read the People's Bible, which is by Professor Hartzell, it's excellent on this verse. But if you read the Bible study series called The Whole Bible Project, and once in a while we have groups that go through The Whole Bible Project, it gets an important point here in Haggai wrong by saying that the word desired here is plural. It's not, it's singular. But the verb will come is plural. And I'm going to talk about that. Have I confused everybody? Pretty much or almost. Anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to it if that's fair enough. Let's, let's finish the book and then we'll come back to this point. <clears throat> the Lord says, the silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord of armies. The glory of this second house will be greater than that of the first one, says the Lord of armies. For in this place I will provide... Peace, declares the Lord of armies. Now, when did God provide peace in the second temple? Jesus. The peace that God gave the universe came through Jesus, really, in, in, in who came when Jesus came and preached in the second temple um, and then was carried out of the temple, driven out of the temple um, in his suffering to be crucified. Today I wrote a devotion and got just from the prayer in, the, in, the, in, in Gethsemane to Jesus' death on Calvary, I found 36 points of suffering, specific points of suffering um, on Christ in that time frame there. And I'm sure that I missed some. Third set of messages, the transfer of cleanness and uncleanness. This is an interesting um, reminder of Levitical law. And trust me, it's not very long. So just bear with me, okay? Just a couple of verses. And some, it's really a, an exercise in logic. 
On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Haggai. This is what the Lord says. Ask the priests about the law. If someone carries consecrated meat in the fold of his garment, first of all, why would you carry consecrated meat in the fold of your garment? Because you went to the temple to make a sacrifice and you forgot the paper plates. So the priest has got his fork, he pulls out the roast or the boiled meat, and he hands it to you, and you take it, and you're like, ow, 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 boom, and you drop it in the fold of your garment. That's how you carried the meat from here over to the picnic tables where you're going to eat with your family, okay? That's how it was done. So, and I know those of you who have ever done laundry are thinking, no! But that's, you know, it's, my, it's, it's his best Sunday shirt. And he just put a chunk of, I almost said ham. It wouldn't be anything except ham. Of, 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 of lamb in his. In, um, so anyway, here's the rule though. If someone carries consecrated meat in the fold of his garment and he touches bread, stew, wine, oil, or any food with the fold of the garment, will that food become holy? And the answer is no. You know, if I happen to be carrying the consecrated meat and it brushes up against something, that doesn't sanctify other things. It's just, it's holy and the other stuff isn't. But then Haggai said, but if one who is unclean from contact with a dead body touches any of those things, will that thing become unclean? And the priest answered, it will be unclean. So if you're handling a dead body... And then you touch, say, a bowl or a glass of wine, that thing becomes unclean because you're unclean. That's the problem. You can transfer uncleanness. Cleanness, ceremonial cleanness, is done by God. Uncleanness is transferred by man. Okay? By the way, who would have contact with a dead body? The family of the dead guy. Yeah, they didn't have morticians. If, if, if you're having a family event and Uncle Fester, forgive me, dies in the living room, uh, for one thing, everybody in the house at that moment is now unclean. And so we go and take care of Uncle Fester. We wash his body, redress it like Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea with the body of Christ on the cross. They take it down, they wrap it. Those two men became ceremonially unclean at that moment because Christ had been dead. And the irony there is, is that you're unclean for a week because you were in contact with a dead body. And how long was Jesus dead? Three days. They were unclean, though, for seven? Were they unclean after Jesus rose from the dead? I, I kind of wonder. I'm not really sure what they thought about that. Um, but, uh, 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 however, uh, the point is uncleanness is transferred. Cleanness is not. Okay, then Haggai responded, well, this is how it is with this people and this is how it is with this nation in my presence, declares the Lord, and this is how it is with all the work of their hands. Everything that they offer there is unclean. You bring stuff to this temple, you've got the wrong feeling in your heart, you don't have faith, it's not clean, and therefore is anything you offer of any value to God? No. No. Now consider your ways carefully. From the time before stone was laid upon stone in the temple of the Lord up to this day, and I think he means the last 16 years, since the first foundation stones were laid up until today. Through all that time, whenever anyone came to a heap of grain to get 20 measures, there were only 10. Whenever anyone came to the wine vat to draw out 50 measures, there were only 20. I struck you and all the work of your hands with blight, mildew, hail, yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. Consider your ways carefully from today, the 24th day of the ninth month, all the way back to the day when the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Consider this. Is there still seed in the barn? The vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, the olive tree have not produced fruit. Is this a law passage? Yes. But here's the next word. But from this day on, 
I will bless you. So God switches here from law to gospel. Why? Because at the, at the end of chapter 1, what did they begun to do? Say it again. Repent. repent. They, had, they repented. They began to, and they showed their repentance by beginning to rebuild the house of the Lord, which was God's will for them at that moment in time. That's what he wanted them to do. And now they've begun. And so God says, I hope you notice all the stuff that was going wrong, and this is why. So now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bless you. And not only am I going to bless you, but I'm going to super bless you. And that's the next couple of verses. As the book ends, fourth message. The word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month, the same day. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, and say, I will shake the heavens and the earth. I will overthrow the thrones of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the nations. Now do you see why he's been calling himself the Lord of armies? I have the power to do this. I will overturn the chariots and those who ride in them. The horses and their riders will go down, each one by the sword of his brother. Armies will destroy one another in the chaos. By the way, earlier in the Old Testament, Whenever you heard about chariots, like in the days of Pharaoh and so forth, chariots in those early days were always just um, fast-moving vehicles. Okay, They didn't fight from chariots. You don't have Pharaoh shooting arrows out of chariots, in those, in, like in the time of Moses. A, a chariot is a limousine or it's a motorcycle with a sidecar. Just gets a guy from A to B quickly. Now, in in Haggai's time, though, the Persians are the ones who perfected fighting out of chariots. And things are going to change. Jamus mentioned Judas Maccabeus a minute ago and um, his uh, army in the the 200s BC are going to fight off um, um, Romans in chariots with their bows and arrows and so forth. They're even going to have to fight. Anybody know what? crazy animal the Maccabees had to fight against? Elephants. Elephants. Yeah, one of the Maccabees actually died fighting against elephants in the Maccabean Wars because the Romans brought them in. Um, Curiosity. If any of you are fans of of J.R.R. Tolkien, Tolkien reflects that in the battle in, uh, of Minas Tirith, of the Pelennor Fields, at the end of the Return of the King, when there's this giant war in front of the big citadel of the, of the Westerners, and they bring in these elephants. Um, uh, they're in, in, the, in the movie, they're gigantic. In the book, they're gigantic too, but they're, I don't know if they're mammoths or mastodons or what, but they're but, um, elephants, just like in the Maccabean Wars. That's where he's getting it from, is from the Maccabees. Okay. <coughs> On that day, declares the Lord of Armies, I will take you, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, my servant, declares the Lord, and I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord of armies. How many times does the Lord say, declares the Lord, in this one verse? It's three, isn't it? Yeah. Um, That's for absolute comfort. I also think that that might be a hidden Trinitarian reference here at the end of Haggai that the Lord speaks his name three times. But what's a signet ring? Yeah, it's a ring that you wore with maybe your name on it or a picture or both. And you'd put it, you'd, you'd stamp it into clay or something to show or into a wax seal, like when Jesus' uh, tomb was covered with a stone and they sealed it. Not because the seal is, is impossible to break, but just because the seal, if it were broken, would show with a, with a signet ring in, indentation that it had been interfered with. That's all that that seal at the tomb meant. I have read and heard and seen depicted many times ancient Egyptian tombs um, often had a seal um, because the doors were not really held together you know, like we would do, like with a lock or something. They were just really roped. A, a rope would pass from one hole to another hole to hold the doors shut. But it would be then... Um, encapsulated the, 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 the knot of the rope inside of a, a hunk of clay with writing on it. That's a clay seal. What I, I'm always stunned by is that archaeologists always insisted on breaking the seal to get into the tomb. 
Why not just cut the rope? Yeah, I, I really, I, I don't get that, but it, it has the same purpose, you know, so just cut the rope. But Riding the horse was a different issue, and people did not know how to ride horses. They were terrified of horses until um, really also Cyrus the Great, the king of Anshan, um, got people up on top of horses. Nobody rode horses um, for a very long time. The earliest account we might have in scripture of somebody riding a horse for any reason might be Nehemiah at this same time period. And we don't know what he rode. He just rode a mount at night around the citadel. Otherwise, horses were just, they just worked. They just pulled things. No, they would, they would have had a, a, a blanket though. Because you, I mean, saddle sore is saddle sore. You know, you don't have to ride a horse very long to get saddle sore. But what they rode you, usually were donkeys and mules because they're more biddable and they're shorter. A horse is a scary critter. Um, I've fought a horse under a tree in a lightning storm with a tornado in the background. And it's not fun. That same horse shaved me off when I rode him once by riding under a, a branch and scraping me off of his back, which the same thing happened to Chuck Yeager the day before he broke the sound barrier. So I have that in common with Chuck Yeager himself. Yes, both heroes. Can we take a couple minutes on this desired of nations uh, I issue in the, in the text? That was the last verse of the book, by the way, a gospel message for Zerubbabel. You're my signet ring, so what you do, Zerubbabel, I'm putting my stamp of approval on. You know, a fantastic uh, little gospel message at the end for the governor. The main argument for desired of nations being a reference to Christ are these. I think I have four things. It's also on, the, on, your, on your back sheet. I took this from, um, I, I wrote a commentary on the book of Haggai, on the Hebrew text of Haggai. I'm sure it'll never get published because who wants to read a, Hebrew, a, a commentary on the Hebrew text of a book? But anyway, it's there. Anyway. I came up with these four things. The prose, poetry, and hymnody of the Christian church. Charles Wesley is the brother who wrote uh, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Diagonal thinking always helps. The hymnody of the Christian church has applied this passage directly to Christ for a few centuries. Three, in fact. The word desired is often used with reference to specific people like Saul, Jehoram, or Daniel. And Christ, although not desired actively by all nations, is the most beneficial gift God has ever given. And although the verb will come is plural, it's uvo, by the way, is how it would be pronounced. The subject desired is in a construct chain with the nations. That is, the whole phrase, even though you have singulars and plurals mixed up, the verb is attracted to the most recent Noun, which is plural, it's called, and then you get something called plural, plural by attraction. Um, it's the way sometimes grammar works in other languages. This is out of the common Hebrew uh, grammar book that we all use, those of us who do Hebrew, called Gazanius Couch, which is why it says GK on the screen. Okay? My Gazanius Couch is a well-worn maroon volume on my shelf. The easiest way to, to get your name on a book is to slightly adapt somebody else's book. And over the centuries, your name will move up the list pretty soon, you know. Ask Dr. Bauer, who wrote the original Greek grammar, Missouri Synod pastor in German, and now Arndt, Gingrich, and Donker have their names above his because they've modified it over the years and translated it into English. And old Pastor Bauer, a wonderful pastor of our fellowship, is practically off of the title of his own book. So, yeah, that's what happens. And finally, Haggai 2.6 says that this will happen in a little while. The first coming of the Messiah would seem to fit this prophecy, including the coming of this house and the glory and the peace. But a couple arguments against this. An even older translation than Charles Wesley, who really, relatively speaking, you know, uh, wrote his hymn yesterday, I mean, it's only a couple hundred years ago. But older traditions and versions and translations of the Bible indicate that something else, like wealth or treasure, is meant. This was Luther's position 200 years before Wesley. Christ, far from being desired by the nations of the world, has been despised and rejected by men. That's Isaiah 53, 4. 
And yeah, the verb come is plural, requiring a plural subject, so riches fits better than Messiah or Christ here. So um, the thing is, what we land on with desired of nations is this. Is it Christ or is it Christ plus all the blessings that come with him? I'm on the side of Christ plus all the blessings that come with him and not Christ alone, but I don't want anybody to get mad at me if I'm going to say it's Christ plus in this case. But what I would like us to do as we finish the book of Haggai, and as long as we're talking about the desired of nations, can we close by singing that verse of Charles Wesley's hymn? Would you guys mind? So, um, da, 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 da. Come, desired of nations, come, fix in us thy humble home. O oh, to all thyself impart, formed in each believing heart. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Hark, the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. And next week, since we start Matthew's gospel, we'll stay in the Christmas season, even as we are on the eve of Lent. You've been listening to Invisible Church, the Bible study podcast from St. Paul's Lutheran Church, New Wall, Minnesota.